Was that Anastasia? Yeah. Oh. Because it was here when I got here? I was like, that was really early. I no, thought that like, I thought maybe it was from a different day. Good morning, everyone. Hi. <laughs> it's so lovely to see everybody. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and get started, and I want to welcome everyone to please join us in this shared sacred space. Um, first, I want to remind everybody to please silence your phones or devices. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm... I'm usually kind of vocal, so I want to make sure we got the mic going. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> so again, I want to welcome everyone into this uh, shared sacred space and ask that we all please silence our devices. We're going to start. Today is Sunday, October 1st. I'm embracing October 1st with my pumpkin shirt. And you can't see them, but I have Halloween shoes on. <laughs> Happy October 1st. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with committee moments. So I would like to welcome up anybody who has committee moments to share. And I believe we also um, end up putting a slide to kind of briefly list committee moments. But if anybody has anything to share, please come up. Um, or, well, I don't know, like maybe not everyone can see the chart, so I would think that if you wanted to also highlight something that's on there. I just want to remind everyone, because I've, I've noticed that um, uh, the um, box is taking longer to get enough to carry over to UCF, that we are still collecting for the Knight's Pantry. So if you have extra canned goods or anything non-perishable that you would like to donate, I try to go over at least once a week, unless I, there's not much in there, and then I only do it every other week. So, But um, that big brown box, 
the front of it has a list of things that they really need at Knight's Pantry, and we are continuing to um, collect from them. Thank you. Good morning, Margie, for membership. Um, if you are not getting the um, UU World, which comes a magazine, a fantastic magazine, by the way, that comes out twice a year, please see me so I can take down your accu accurate mailing address and get that to you. Hey, guys. Derek, Facilities and Grounds. <laughs> Workday uh, is one week later this month because of... Uh, our involvement in the Pride Parade, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and the focus will be landscaping. <laughs> Hi, Chloe Hatfield with Women's Group. So, um, October 6 at 6:30 this Friday, we'll be having Women's Group, and we are going to be uh, learning about divination. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm just wanting to let everyone know that this coming Saturday in uh, Orlando at the corner of Orange and Anderson near City Hall, there's going to be a national march to protect trans youth. So if any of you want to, go to that. It's not an official UUUF event, but I was told that it was appropriate to come and let all of you guys know because you guys probably would be interested in it. Thank you. Thank you. So my opening words this morning are um, from Yasutani Roshi, a Zen master, and they are, the fundamental delusion of humanity is to suppose that I am here and you are there, meaning our bodies may be separate, but we are all connected. Um, so I'm going to keep it short and simple this morning. We're going to head on into opening music which is hymn number 38, um, Morning Has Broken, and it is going to be led this morning by Michael. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This is a really familiar uh, hymn to all of you. Uh, we sing it quite often here, and that's great. Um, I looked up it last night that the words were by an English poet by the name of Eleanor Fajan, who was born in 1881, and she died in just uh, not too long ago, 1965. Not too long ago, at least as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and she wrote this, uh, the words to this poem um, from inspiration she gained from the village of Alfriston. And I knew, uh, Carl and Anne's friends are uh, probably very familiar with Alfreston as are uh, Carl and Anne. It's a beautiful old village in the south of England, 18 miles from where I used to live. Um, the, the words were set to a traditional uh, Scottish Gaelic tune, uh, Bonason, named after a village of the same name on the island of Mull, uh, up off the northwest uh, part of Scotland. It's often sung in children's services. It's often sung here as well. Many are familiar with the Cat Stevens uh, recording with the p uh, piano arrangement uh, performed by Rick Wakeman. Some of you may want to mention Rick Wakeman uh, to Larry this morning. He lit up when I said that his <laughs> name. Um, he was a great, he uh, still is, a great English keyboard player and best known as being a f former member of the progressive rock group, yes. yes. So let us sing Morning Has Broken. Please stand. Get a good deep breath in. And let us rejoice. <laughs>
Beautiful. <clears throat> this morning, we have a chalice lighter. Um, her name is Anastasia. Her pronouns are she, her. She is 10 years old. And her joy today is that she's happy she got her hair cut. Hey. Join me as we say these words together. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to seek, to sustain, and to share. And we also uh, say our affirmation together. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its gift. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek truth and love, and to help one another. So now I'd like to take some time to welcome all of our guests. Um, <clears throat> our speakers and topics vary weekly. We have a part-time minister who um, speaks twice a month. And then uh, the rest of our speakers and topics um, are people that are members of our congregation, like today, also from like the local universities. We have scholars. We have lots of different people come in and speak on a lot of different topics. So if this is your first time here or you're relatively new, I highly encourage you to come back because you're very likely to hear something different every time. With that being said, we are a congregation that holds um, shared values. So ultimately, our values um, are aligned but we have very diverse beliefs. Um, I also want to say hello to everyone that is watching online. Uh, everybody wave, hello. <laughs> Thank you for also joining us. At this time, one of the things that we also do is called joys and concerns. This is where if you are um, willing, as you like, you can come up and share your joys and concerns because we know that the weight of concerns are lightened um, when we share them with others and our joys are expounded when we share those with others. So I would welcome anybody to come up and share their joys and concerns this morning. Also remember, this is being broadcast, so. I have a joy. I went to Margie's house and I, I went to the pool. And I also eat them. My joy is that the dog is thoroughly recovered, which is always a good thing, and the man is back here with me today. Good morning, Michael Richards here. Um, I just want, I have a great joy that uh, yesterday we had David Novak here uh, leading a workshop on storytelling. And it was amazing, a um, really good time. And then uh, he gave a, uh, a program at uh, First U uh, last night, um, which was terrific as well. He told some great stories and explained why they were important to him. Um, he's looking forward to coming back again. So I hope that'll give us a, more of an opportunity to get together. We had about 16, 17 here yesterday for the workshop. Only 15 showed up for the program at 1U last night, which was really unfortunate because they missed a really good program. The other joy that I have is my daughter who's been home sick for the last week with no voice at all, and her job requires her speaking on the telephone all the time. So that didn't help. Uh, she went back to work today, so I'm really thankful for that. Hi, Chloe Hatfield. Um, so most of you know that I work at this place called a petrified forest that comes every September, October. And we just had our opening night and already it's been fantastic. I'm having so much fun in my role. I can't tell you about it, so you're gonna have to come out and see me in my role, right? <laughs> right? Um, like how Carrie and Patrick and Kat and Colton did last night. It was really nice seeing them. And my parents came out and friends of mine were able to come out too. So it was just really fun being able to scare my parents. <laughs> and uh, everybody else that I saw, it was really fun. And I'm just so happy. Love this time of year. Mm -hmm. 
Hi there, I'm Evelyn Shalond, and for those of you who don't know me, I will say, I don't know a lot of you anymore. I have been a member here since before this building was built, and over the past several years, of course, being not only an older member, but an older person, I have been cautious about coming into anything that's a crowd. So coming today to say goodbye to people that I dearly love has been a wonderful trip but also to see so many new faces, because it's always nice to see something that you've known from this to being a much more growing situation, and that is a joy. So I hope we all have a lovely day today, and welcome everybody who is new to me. Thank you. I've been flooded out of my house. Three, three weeks ago, I went to a birthday party at New Smyrna Beach. When I came home, the daughter raised the garage door, and there was water on the floor. She said, oh, your water heaters had a problem. Well, when I opened the kitchen door, the water came out. The pot in the second bathroom had broken some sort of a gasket, and we don't know whether the water had been running two, three, or four days. So I'm all boxed up, 27 fans later. They've ordered the wood for the floor, so I'm about to get back together. I'm gonna share a, a joy cern, which is around I think around two to three months ago, John Mowbray emailed me and he said, I want you to play caravan with me on, um, at the service. And uh, the day before, I realized I could not play caravan. <laughs> um, pretty thoroughly couldn't play caravan. <laughs> so, uh, Regretfully, was not able to play with him. I felt very bad about it. And uh, a week ago, John uh, sent a much easier piece of music for me. <laughs> I got a good solid, you know, four notes I got to play in it. And uh, I was like, yeah, I could do this one. And we uh, practiced um, um, Friday for about, I think we practiced for about 30 minutes. We talked for about two hours. <laughs> And anyone who knows John probably is familiar with that. And <laughs> what has been very nice is uh, when Allison and I first joined, um, John and Amy were very welcoming, um, helped us uh, feel at home, and uh, he really helped me get out of my comfort zone with performing. So um, it's very sad to uh, see them go, but um, it's been very beautiful to have the moments that we've uh, shared together, and I really appreciate you guys, so thank you. So uh, my oldest grandson lives in Detroit, five years old, and um, uh, within the last year, for some reason, I, and I, what do I understand about medical things? Absolutely nothing, really, unless it happens to somebody I know in my family and I hear what they tell me. But anyway, his eye started pulling in, so, um, and uh, all the therapies they tried did not work. So he had surgery, and um, his eyes are great. His Uncle Frank came to visit him, and he told his Uncle Frank, Uncle Frank, I used to see two things, and now I just see one. So it's like, thank goodness, thank goodness we, have, we live now with the kind of medical technology that we all benefit from. Good, good morning. My name is Miguel Rodriguez. Uh, I have a couple of joys, though, from uh, online Zoom. Rachel uh, Wisner, I hope I got it right. And also... Anita, okay. So uh, Rachel uh, Joy was attending the Storyline workshop and show, but her concern is that her um, arthritis is uh, affecting her shoulder and elbow. Um, her daughter, Jamie, went to the Petrified Forest on Friday with friends and then loved it. Okay. <laughs> and uh, mm, let me see. Hold on. This is a 
direct message, so I'm, let me read it before I. Uh, um, okay, I think this is okay. This it's somebody um, Anita uh, having having an issue with tickets. Um, uh, was on YouTube. Tried to buy tickets to the show last night, but no tickets were available. Wasn't sure how uh, uh, I would feel. The tickets for children under 18 were available. I thought it was sold out. I think, okay. Okay. So I don't know what tickets they were talking about. Oh, okay. Oh, the story. Okay. So that was a concern. Okay. That was it. Thank you. <laughs> Can we please have a moment of silence for all those joys and concerns shared and not shared? Thank you. With that, um, I also forgot something. My name is Michelle Flores. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I also want to remind everyone that flu and cold season is coming up very quickly, and it's complicated even more so than usual. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> cold and flu season is coming up quickly and is complicated even more so by the fact that there's like a different uh, COVID strain. Um, so while it's not as deadly, it's still very serious, and we want to, um, and it is easily spread. So we want to make sure that we urge everyone to stay home if you're not feeling well, Feel free to watch us and join us online, um, on YouTube, or you can join the Zoom watch party, and you can find the link for each of those on the Notable News. So, um, yes, time for all ages, led by our RE coordinator, James. Hello, everyone. Today, uh, I'm going to be telling a story about a dove and an ant, and would anyone like to come out and help me uh, tell it by acting it out? Yes, both of you. As many as want to come up. Okay, there we go. Okay, so let's go ahead and assign roles here. We need someone to be an ant, someone to be a dove, and someone to be a man. I think you can only choose for yourself. You'd like to be the ant? Okay. What would you guys like to be? I would like to be the man. Okay. Would you, would you be okay doing being the dove? Okay. You might want to watch out for... Yeah. Okay. So, once upon a time, there was a little ant who was crawling along a tree branch heading towards a really tasty looking leaf. You can just crawl along. There we go, there we go. When all of a sudden, a huge gust of wind came and threw the ant into the river below. Oh. The little ant struggled and struggled to swim to the shore, but the current was so strong, the little ant just couldn't, couldn't get anything. It was just going along. Now, a dove happened to be uh, nearby and saw the little ant and felt pity for the little ant. And so the dove went ahead and got a little uh, piece of straw from the ground we're, we're not actually going to, yeah, just an imaginary straw, imaginary straw. And dropped it next to the little ant. The ant grabbed onto the piece of straw like a life preserver and safely floated to the shore. Now, when this happened, the little ant thanked the dove profusely, um, and they parted the ways. But then, a few days later, the little ant was searching for seeds in a nearby meadow, and happened to catch a glimpse of the little dove that had saved it the other day before. Just then, the ant also noticed that there was a hunter in the woods. And this hunter was about to throw a rock at the dove. Now, the little ant remembered the dove's kindness shown a few days before, and so the ant quickly scurried onto the hunter's ankle. You don't have to actually scurry onto Anastasia's ankle. You are the hunter. You are the hunter. And bit the hunter's ankle right as the hunter was about to throw the sto stone, messing up the hunter's ape. So the hunter missed, and the rock, landing a few feet away from the dove, startled the dove and made sure the dove could see that the hunter was there, and the dove flew away to safety. Now the ant, not wanting to get squished by the hunter, quickly scurried off of the hunter's leg and into a nearby uh, log. 
And this is how the ant repaid the dove's kindness by saving the dove's life. Everyone can take a bow. So thank you, everyone, who helped us act that out. Now, what do you guys think the lesson from this story might be? You can raise your hand. Okay. My weekly exercise. <laughs> help others and they might help you. Very good, very good. We got another over here. Treat us how you want to be treated. Very good, very good. Pay it forward. There we go. Another wonderful one. Okay. okay. You're closer. We all need to look out for each other. Very good, very good. I really like this story. Lots of wonderful lessons. Help others even if you don't think they can help you. Very good, very good. Anyone else? Ah, there we go. Sometimes help comes in the most unlikely forms. Awesome. Awesome. See, I, such wonderful lessons from this story. It's, it's a really good one. So, all of those are wonderful lessons. Most of them have to do with the idea of kindness, which I'm very fond of. I actually have a bracelet that says kindness rocks that I'm wearing right now. Uh, and kindness is also the theme that our littlest UUs and upper elementary kids will be learning about in RE today. Uh, and so I thought it was appropriate to go ahead and have a nice little story about kindness for all of us. And I think most of us agree that it was a good story, right? Absolutely. Good. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And remember to be kind. First of all, I really enjoyed this story, but I absolutely love the acting. Thank you for everybody that participated. That was fantastic. <laughs> um, now it's time for our interlude and offering. Um, for this week, 40% of the um, plate will go to Floridians Protecting Freedom um, as we do share 40% uh, of all of our weekly offerings with um, a different organization. I think we change it every quarter. For today's song, um, they are playing Largo from Concerto in D for guitar. The music is by Antonio Vivaldi, um, by John Mowbray, and John, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Martinus. Martinus. John Mowbray and John Martinus. John and John. Got J and J.
That was beautiful. <clears throat> so we'll sing our children out as they are already leaving. Uh, <laughs> We love you and bless you and send you on your way. We love you and bless you today and every day. Excellent. So um, this morning, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce Allison Van Tilburg. Yeah, all right, I'm on a roll. Um, <laughs> Allison is a Rollins alum and scholar of vegan feminist studies at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. In 2021, she founded The Sanford Vegan, a blog and social media presence that highlights vegan restaurants and pop-ups rooted in the Orlando area. She's a staff writer for Veg Out Magazine and the founder of Interfaith Now, a digital media collective with over 200 contributors that aims to bridge gaps, expand perspectives, and unify humanity through stories of faith, spirituality, and religion. And she's also a member of this church. Welcome, Allison. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, perfect. Okay, let me figure out where to put my water. There we go. Um, thank you all. Huh? There's also a thing underneath. Cool. Thank you for letting me speak, first of all. I've been reflecting a lot today about growing up in a church, my dad being a pastor, seeing my dad preach, seeing my brother preach, and I realized I've never had the opportunity to speak in front of a church. So this is kind of a life I wouldn't say culmination point, but it, it's significant, for sure. And just to have my husband playing in front of you all, it's just, it's a good feeling. Um, let's see. What I want to talk about today is food and how food can repair the world. Um, I'm very interested in food, um, but food is more than just sustenance. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in kind of an eclectic way. I don't expect you to walk away today with a super deep understanding of food studies, but I do want you to walk away thinking a little bit more about food than maybe you did when you walked in. So I'm going to put my husband to work. Um, <laughs> I want to ask everyone in the congregation, what do you think of when you think about food? That can be a really basic thought, or it can be something a bit more philosophical. What, what is food to you? I'm looking for like three or four thoughts. The food is things that I eat yep. um, because my body needs it. Very good. Very good. Food is medicine. Mm, love that. Interdependence. Interdependence. I love it. Okay, I see a few hands. We'll do a few more. Food today in the modern world for uh, it, folks in developed countries, and I'm just thinking about our country, for example, is often unidentifiable. Mm. A lot of the things we buy, we're not quite sure what's in them, where they came from, who made it. Yep. Very true. Um, I, and I'm, I'm also speaking for others, not necessarily in this congregation, but I know in the world, um, that when we think of eating, we think of how we can eat, how we can get all the food groups and not be sick mm. after every meal. Mm. So. I love it. Good participation. I've been thinking about food lately, a great deal of people who don't have any. Mm. And that concerns me, especially when I cannot imagine holding my child starving to death. So I think food is a big concern there. Um, think about how food can be delicious. There's many different kinds of delicious. And uh, some people like this and some people like that which is good, otherwise they'd all eat my favorite and I wouldn't get enough. <laughs> and um, that there's, there can always be something different going on in your food, in my food, because I have, I have a lot of choices available to me and I'm, I'm grateful for all that. Food is a sacrament. 
too. Mm. Yes. Yes. So I come from a big Sicilian family. Manja is our watchword. Um, we're a bunch of foodies, and food is almost central to almost everything. Yes, I agree. I want to echo what Lorraine said. Food is complicated. Complicated. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? All over the place today. Thank you. Um, kind of echoing what Peter said about the sacrament of food, it's also a community, communion. Um, all the major religions of the world, I believe, celebrate around food, whether it be the Jewish Shabbat, uh, services, Christian communion, uh, Eid after Ramadan, and so on and so forth. Absolutely. Very good. I love that. We got a good, robust uh, collective of ideas around food, which I love. Okay. Um, I don't think the... Okay, can you just move to the next slide? Yeah, so food is not just sustenance. It is sustenance, um, but it is not just this material um, form of energy that helps us survive. And it's also not neutral. You know, a lot of you are bringing up issues of justice, uh, you know, places in the world where people don't have food. Maybe there are participating factors in the creation of food that lead to injustice. So we're going to fill in this blank a little bit today. Um, and it's possible that not all of us are going to have the same word for what we're going to fill in. But we're going to explore um, things that food can be that maybe we haven't considered before. So next slide. I now I can try again. Yay. Awesome. So... <laughs> Food is history. I'm sort of obsessed with food. Um, you probably got that from my intro. I study food in my master's program at um, Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. Uh, and I have a few images here on the board of uh, my history with food. Over here on the left, we have a Dutch dish called Borenkolstampelt. Uh, so I'm from the Netherlands. I was born in the Netherlands. I have a Dutch passport. Um, and this is a dish I think about when I think about connecting to my Dutch roots, uh, the stuff that my Oma would make for us, specifically in the winter, because it's a winter dish and you can never have it in the summer. She always tells me when I ask her to make it in the summer. Uh, so, you know, it, it's something that is very nostalgic. It connects me to roots that I no longer really, I mean, I'm not living in the Netherlands anymore. So when I engage in a form of that meal, it's a reconnection to my heritage. Um, the next picture there is Elton Brown from Good Eats. Um, I loved this show. When I moved to the US when I was six years old, Food Network was my primary form of entertainment. Um, living with my grandparents, they always had it on. And I just fell in love with this show. If you've ever watched it, it's every episode's about a different kind of food. And um, he had like 200, 300 episodes. I printed out the list of every episode and taped it to my door of my room, and I would highlight every episode. I watched this was before streaming, so you couldn't just find, oh, the marshmallow episode. So I just kept on waiting for the episodes I hadn't watched yet to come. In the science, yeah. So it was the history, the science. It was super fascinating. Um, and then also Cupcake Wars. I don't know if you ever watched that. Um, I watched that a lot with my parents, and we kind of made a activity out of it. We would check out new cupcakeries, and this is also where I first learned of the concept of veganism, which is a huge part of my life now. And when I heard this on Cupcake Wars, that there were places that made vegan cupcakes, I was disgusted. I was frightened. How can you do that? That's against God's will. And, you know, it was a lot. It was very difficult for me as an eight-year-old to handle that that would exist. But um, my point is, it has a lot to do with the media I consumed. It had to do with things that I did with my family. And it did, had to do with connecting back to the heritage that, um, you know, was harder to hold on to as I moved to the States. Um, and as I got older, books became a really big part of my interest in food as well. These are just three of the books that I reference uh, frequently in my studies. The first is The Genesis Diet, which was my gateway drug to veganism. Um, I was 16 years old, picking up my brother from school. I wanted to get chocolate milk at Target. Walked into Target, saw that there was a vegan chocolate milk, and that was 
disturbing. Um, but yet, I got it for some reason, and I enjoyed it, and I had a lot of questions. I was like, wait, why does this exist? Why does this need to exist? Why is this selling? Why did I buy it? Talked to my parents, and my parents referred to me to this book, The Genesis Diet, which sort of breaks down the biblical creation story. Um, I grew up in a Christian home. But looking at it as this is sort of a plant-based fruitarian utopia, um, that the food that was seen as good to eat in Eden was vegan. And maybe that was our original diet. Maybe there's a reason why there wasn't death. Maybe, you know, th there's a lot of different considerations also for animals not eating each other. It was just a different world. And that painted the picture and planted the seed, pun intended, of what I could be one day. Um, not that I became vegan. It was many years before I became vegan. But that was something that very much inspired me. Um, and then Carol J. Adams, I love this woman. Um, she wrote a book called The Sexual Politics of Meat that really confirmed a lot of suspicions I had about the connection between um, women, feminism, and the production of food that we're going to talk a little bit about later because they're very deeply connected topics. Um, the idea of being consumed and also offering oneself up to be consumed is very heavily explored in this book. And um, she wrote this in the 90s, and a lot of my scholarship is sort of advancing the notions that she outlines in her book. Uh, she also was a theologian who ended up becoming a vegan scholar, which is interesting. And then finally, um, this book, Eating as Tikkun, which honestly is going to be the most important thing I talk about today, which is about not veganism. They talk a lot about eating animals in this book, but it's a Jewish text that sort of um, elaborates on this idea that it's not just what you eat, it's how you eat. It's the intention in which you eat that not only creates reality, but repairs reality. So on the next slide, I have a quote from that book that I really like. Um, the first entry of evil into humanity was through this act of unholy eating. Until that fateful moment, evil existed outside of themselves, Adam and Eve, embodied as the serpent. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they brought an intermingling of good and evil into themselves, into the very substance of their being. Whenever we eat with a proper kavana, we repeat this original sin. The primary fixing for human civilization is to learn to eat in holiness. And kavana means intention or sincere feeling. So what happens when we eat without thinking about what's in our food or how our food came into existence is that um, we're bringing a mix of evil and good into being, um, which is, it might just be something to consider, some food for thought. Um, it's <laughs> pun intended again, um, which actually, let's just skip this slide quick. I'll go back to it. Um, we use food uh, metaphors, allegories in our speech all the time. I've done this several times just in talking unintentionally, um, which speaks to the fact that food is more than just sustenance, right? We use food to communicate ideas. Um, and this has been something that's existed for thousands of years. So um, uh, some of you youngins might be familiar with this concept of getting that bread. Um, <laughs> that's, that's alluding to um, making money. Of course, there's this ancient um, Roman idea of bread and circuses, um, which of course means more than just bread and circuses. Even the word meat um, is sort of a transfiguration of the concept of a dead corpse that you have to change into meat to feel okay about consuming. Um, and I promise you that not all of this is going to be about veganism, but that's just where I'm coming from. Uh, so um, there's a lot, lot of uh, allusions to that. Food for thought, I think I just said that in the last slide. Um, saying your toast, considering America a melting pot or a salad, these are all food allusions we make um, to explain reality. So it's very much integrated with the way we think about anything. And just a very quick aside about famous vegetarians throughout history. Um, Vegetarianism or veganism is not like a new fad. I know that it's been huge explosion in the last few years. 5% of the population identifies as vegetarian. 2% um, identify as vegans, much higher than one might think. This is a list of people who were vegetarian or vegan. Um, my, boy, my boy Tolstoy is at the top of it. Love Tolstoy. He was 
um, a big advocate of nonviolence in general, which applied also to animals, and a lot of these people fall into that. There's generally a connection between people who um, argue for nonviolent action and vegetarianism, which isn't too surprising, but um, yeah, we, we have people all the way back to Pythagoras, who was vegetarian, Leonardo da Vinci, um, and also more recent people, Paul McCartney, Bill Clinton. Anyways, uh, other way. So, um, food as community. We sort of alluded to this with different faith traditions. Um, food is a very powerful tool to create community, to create bonds where there were not bonds before. So when you have a first date, what are you gonna suggest that you do with that person? I know I give away on the screen, but you know. Um, you suggest to get something to eat. You know, share a meal. It's either at your house, it's at a restaurant, or you're getting coffee. Um, there's something that happens, mystically, I would say, when you are engaging together, even if you're not eating the same food, with this process of sustaining yourself together. So food has the power to imbue memories, um, new connections, new relationships. Um, and this is something that has existed also for thousands of years, not just in the familial context, but in creating um, community outside of the ones that you've been given. So the agape meals um, in the early church are a great example. It was not complicated. Come to my house at this time. We're going to keep it hush-hush. But um, potluck, bring your own food. We're going to talk about you know, loving each other and stuff, but it was all happening around um, a meal. And even the Eucharist itself is engaging in a meal with other people that transforms you uh, in a literal sense, in a spiritual sense. It also has the power to reinforce bonds. You know, earlier I was talking about Dutch food and my born Stompot. Whenever I eat that, I feel more connected to my Dutch heritage. Um, and there's also holidays like Thanksgiving, which reinforce different identity notions, such as being American or um, being family. If you're at the Thanksgiving table, you're family. But it also has the power to break bonds, right? So when I became vegan, it kind of created a little bit of a problem. What was I going to eat at Thanksgiving? How, how was I going to eat Dutch food? You know, what was it, how was I going to eat my um, brochicas, you know, my, my cheese sandwich that's so, you know, quintessential. so quintessential to my existence was how I knew cheese, how I knew butter. I don't accept that fake stuff. So what does it mean then to be Christian and vegan, American and vegan, Dutch and vegan? These seem to be... Um, incompatible ideas. So food has the ability to um, complicate things, to bring things together, to bring them apart. Food is also a vehicle for patriarchy and feminism. Um, here's a rhetorical question. Who throughout history has been more responsible for the cooking and preparation of food for the family? Yeah, mm. and who has also been expected to offer up their own literal body as food and sustenance for the next generation? Okay, every time. Um, who is more likely to become vegan or vegetarian? Okay, so there's some connection that's going on here throughout time between um, women who have this intimacy with food period and also being concerned about where food is coming from and um, the various issues surrounding it, justice issues as well. And um, we've talked a little bit about Eucharist, we've talked a little bit about Christianity and food, and I wanted to also offer up this idea that, you know, here we have an image of Jesus on the cross, juxtaposed with the Eucharist breaking of bread, and how, like women throughout time, the figure of Jesus offers up his body as a sacrifice, offers himself to be consumed through this ritual that happens um, on a regular basis, which kind of identifies um, the suffering, 
broken sacrifice of Jesus in the context of women, in the context of feminism, but also in the context of animals, which we're going to explore a little bit, because animals do the same thing, right? They offer their bodies. They don't always get a say in it. Um, so food is highly integrated with these gendered relations. Um, there's a sociological thing going on here that goes beyond just a baby consuming breast milk or um, meatloaf being ready for dinner. Go to the next slide. Food has a lot to do with justice and injustice. Um, I've alluded to it before. Animals, I, I think we can all agree that animals don't say, oh, pick me, pick me. I, I want to be dinner tonight. Um, but they are. They often become dinner. And that's a justice issue. That's an issue of agency. That's an issue of um, autonomy. And it goes beyond just the um, physical body of animals when it comes to this. Um, their young are taken away from them and used as food. Um, depending on the sex of an animal, they are um, separated and used for different purposes. If you are an animal in the animal agriculture industry, you are born a woman, good news, you get to live longer. You don't get slaughtered pretty much upon being born, but you have to live a life of sexual exploitation. So you are prioritized based on your role as a female animal. Right? As a female animal, you are expected to perform over and over and over and over again. Um, and then when you can no longer produce, you're killed. So that's a justice issue. Um, I also have an image here on the screen of a Carl's Jr. ad where there is a connection being made between the consumption of a burger and the consumption of an attractive young female on the beach. There are... Um, Advertising messages that encourage, and I could talk about this for a really long time, and we're not going to do that today, um, that encourage seeing women as something to be consumed, to control, to be dominated, and food as a vehicle. The burger represents the domination of an animal um, because we've killed it and packaged it, and in the same way we have stripped this woman of agency, packaged it, ready for consumption. Food also has an issue of justice for the planet. Um, I think most of us have probably heard that the animal agriculture industry is pretty bad for the planet. Um, and livestock specifically have a lot to do with that. Methane production impacting um, you know, the ozone layer. But also 80% of all agricultural land is being used for livestock right now, which is pretty wild. And most of the food that we're growing on, the rest of the land is being fed to the animals, which actually ends up leading to a net negative caloric intake. You know, if we would have just reallocate the calories that are being allocated to animals right now, we could feed more people. Um, but we can feed everyone anyways. But that's a different issue. Um, in the EU, over 60% of the cropland is used to produce animal feed rather than human feed. So the way that we produce our food right now is unsustainable and it's hurting the planet. And then there's the issue of labor. Um, undocumented workers are usually getting the short end of the stick for not just slaughterhouses, um, but also in the fields producing food. Um, we have a great organization locally in Apopka that helps these field workers and advocates for them. Um, but it's in these industries that have to do with producing food that people are getting exploited in profound ways. And we can think a little bit about why is that? Why, why is there this connection with food and exploitation, period, not just meat? Why are these industries the ones that we are um, leeching off of people that have no other options? And in slaughterhouses specifically, even with undocumented workers, we have the highest turnover rate of any industry um, because of psychological trauma, um, getting hurt in the workplace. It's a very dangerous work. It's very difficult work um, psychologically. So 
Those in the food industry, like those associated with food, animals, women, undocumented workers, are severely exploited. And um, I have a quote here from Cesar Chavez, um, who talks a little bit about farm workers. We farm workers are the closest to food production. We were the first to recognize the serious health hazards of agriculture, agricultural pesticides, both for consumers and ourselves. Um, it doesn't just affect the workers, it also affects us, is the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, there is a whole chain of events that ends up not just being um, injustice toward the people producing the food, but ends up being injustice for us too, because we're not getting the best food um, that we need. So all that was really grim. Um, not very many good things I had to say there, but I hope it gives you something to think about. But the main thought I want to leave with today is that food can be a vehicle for repairing the world. So some of you are probably familiar with the term tikkun olam. The name of this presentation uh, was um, Eating as Tikkun, sort of referencing um, Susan Schneider's book that I love. Um, I pulled a series of quotes from here to kind of elaborate on this idea. The main tikkun of a human life, at least quantitatively, happens through eating. It is strange but true that eating is a powerful spiritual act. The spark inside simpler organisms actually carries the most transcendent possibilities of awareness, through their, though their vessels cannot express the full measure of these lights. The food spark brings a new possibility of grasping this truth, and the human soul expands with its light. So this quote, along with the quote that I read earlier in the presentation, um, alludes to this idea that what you eat is really important. Um, I'm obviously going to say a plant-based diet is the ideal diet, but you can disagree with me. So it's what you eat, and it's how you eat. And that is something that everyone in this room can do. That's when we have lunch afterwards celebrating John and Amy. We can do this. We can think about how we're eating. Where is this food coming from? What are all the steps that went into this food? Um, because Susan Schneider argues in her book that it's not just in this allegorical story of Adam and Eve that they ate something that was not for them. It was the way that they went, ooh, yes, let me look at that, and did not think about what it was, how it came into being, uh, to honor it. So, Tikkun Olam, I'll quote from the Chabad website, it's a Jewish organization, means to do something with the world that will not only fix any damage, but also improve upon it. So I believe that food can not only, um, changing the way our food structures work can not only fix uh, the systems we have, you know, to try to reach um, a goal, but to, to surpass it, to radically improve the world that we exist in, and that also means radically improving our bodies, radically improving um, systems of injustice, and maybe restructuring the way we think about it in a gendered way. So, we've talked about this. Food is not just sustenance. It has all these sociological dimensions, anthropological dimensions. It's not just material. Um, it's not neutral, right? Food is not just something you pick up on the way home through a drive through and it's just there. Uh, there is a long process that went into creating your food. So food is, I want you to answer that for yourself. What is food to you? For me, it's a vehicle to repair the world. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about these topics, I write about it a lot online. You just search my name, Allison J. Van Tilburg, um, because there was no way to talk about all this stuff today, but I have a lot of articles online that cross-reference veganism to specific faith traditions. Um, I have stuff on Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, um, Christianity, and then also just a lot of work on feminism and veganism. But thank you for listening. That's it. Appreciate it.
that's it. Like that wasn't a big thing. <laughs> you did a great job. Um, I mean, I think we could probably do one or two, and then afterwards we're obviously having lunch and stuff. So if you'd want further conversation, I would also recommend that. Yes, I'll be around later also. Um, Thank you. That mm -hmm. was fascinating. You made a statement that we can feed the whole world. Can you elaborate on that? Um, well, with the systems that we have in place now that are currently being allocated toward animals, um, we have enough calories to feed the whole world. It's just that our structures are not good and the way that we're using our food is not good. The distribution, the distribution is trash, um, to put it lightly. But it, that, that's what's so sad about the situation is that we have the ability. Um, we're, just not, we're just not doing it. The will is not there. Yep. Um, my mouth around here has always been speaking politically. So speaking politically, mm -hmm. I think to myself, I see so much of an occasion where food throughout the world is used politically. Yes, absolutely. Uh, in, in terms of females, uh, one thing comes to mind in the 50s and 60s, um, there was a movement for women to stop breastfeeding. Yeah. Even in countries where people were starving and it was imposed again on women as, no, 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 you should save your breasts. I don't know for whom, mm -hmm. but we won't go into yeah. that. Anyway, yeah. the deal is that, you know, when I had children way back then, I breastfed. And let me tell you, it was almost impossible in the hospital. They would come in and give you something, and I always asked, what is in the little <laughs> souffle cup? And they would say, oh, well, that's just to dry up your breast milk. Well, I don't think the baby would be thrilled with that. I would uh. say. So, you know, this went on a great deal, and it was worldwide and quite horrible. And food has always been used by dictatorships in terms of if you keep people fed, they won't rebel as mm -hmm. much as when you know. So I think that that has been a very, very political instrument. Anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. I would hope that you would have the opportunity sometime to talk to us more about feminism. I'd love to. I loved it. Originally, that was what my presentation was going to be on, exclusively that topic, but I was like, oh, that might be a little too much. Right up. Fun. Not for me. Not for you. Not too Good. Much. Good. I love that. Thank you for that feedback. All right. Thank you. Excellent. Whew. <clears throat> Um, so now it's time to extinguish this chalice. Will you please say the words together as I extinguish the flame? Thank you. And I want to thank you all for being here today, both here in person and online, um, and for sharing this time together. I it means a lot to me. Um, for our closing music, we're going to perform. Larry and John Mowbray are going to uh, play on the guitar, and I'm going to sing. And um, we chose the song Change by Tracy Chapman.
with a dream How bad, how good does it need to get? How many losses, how much regret? What chain reaction would cause an effect? Makes you turn around Makes you try to explain Makes you forgive and forget Makes you change Makes you change If you knew that you would be alone Knowing right Being wrong would you change Would you change If you knew that you would find the truth That brings a pain that can't be soothed Would you change Would you change How bad, how good does it need to get? How many losses, how much regret? What chain reaction would cause an effect? Makes you turn around Makes you try to explain Makes you forgive and forget Makes you change Makes you change Are you so upright you can't be there? If it comes to you, know, are you so sure you won't be calling? If not for the good, why is falling? Why is falling? Everything you think you know makes your life unbearable. Would you change? Would you change? We promise and vow, and hard times come to bring you down. Would you change? Would you change? If you knew that you would die today. If you saw the face of God alone. Would you change? Would you change? Would you change? Would you change? If you saw the face of God in love If you saw the face of God in love Would you change? So now for our closing words. Again, I just want to thank everybody for being here today. Um, I encourage everyone to think about, um, you know, what's been said and, you know, kind of take like what speaks to you. And for my closing words, um, they're by Amit Ray, author of Meditation, Insights, and Inspirations. 
You are never alone. You are eternally connected with everyone. So I just want to remind you all that we are all connected. And um, please feel free to reach out and reach out to your neighbors and be kind to each other. Thank you.